Hello, my name is Cal Molone from Richmond, Virginia, and I'm an anarchist. In today's feature of News from Underground, we're going to continue our series of interviews of local Richmond anarchists. And today's guest I have with me is Herzon Flores. And so, I guess, well, I guess we'll like to start off from, from the beginning, I guess, in, in areas like, how did you find yourself here in Richmond? Uh, fair enough. So, I moved to Richmond proper about two years ago. My family lived in Mechanicsville, Virginia, and they, before that, we've moved everywhere else. Originally, I was born in Indianapolis, Indiana. Uh, oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But my family, my family's actually from Mexico City. Uh, and I lived all across the eastern seaboard. And I mainly stayed in Richmond because I like the community here and also because I wanted to stay at VCU. Right. What uh, were you studying at VCU? I was studying biochemistry at VCU. And I also, and I haven't finished my degree. I'm some kind of super senior now, but I only have a couple classes left. Right. So I guess your parents... Uh, I guess you came here with your parents to uh, Richmond. Yeah. So what brought them here? My dad, when he, when we were in Newport News, he actually got a job with the state, and he was doing a lot of work uh, with biosecurity, making sure like that animals didn't get infected and trying to like control where animals go and what people. They were the guys who say make the rules about what you can't eat and when you can't eat it or how you can't kill something and who you can buy it from. Mm -hmm. uh, they're very tight about it and usually that's supposed to be controlled by the Fed but Virginia has special rules where Virginia gets to say what they want to do instead of doing what the Fed tells them to do. Hmm. That's a whole other story yeah, 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 of yeah, red yeah. government tape in and of itself. Needless to say, my father hated that job. Right. He hated it completely, he thought it was stupid and inane and he promptly went to do something else. Right, so I guess you say you went to high school here, uh, public school. Yes, I went to three. Camps. I went to three different high schools here in Virginia. Um, I graduated from Hanover High School in Mechanicsville, Virginia, and um, for me, I didn't like high school at all. I did everything I could to get out as fast as I could. <laughs> uh, I graduated early. I graduated my junior year, and I was so glad when I got to college. Yeah, it was so <laughs> much better. Like. It wasn't even that the, te the like teaching... Was it like High School Musical Part 2? Uh, it wasn't even that the teachers were bad. I liked most of the teachers. Mm -hmm. But the curriculums, I could very much tell that the curriculums they were teaching were not what they were not at the speed or were not how they wanted to teach it. And they were essentially teaching you the SOL tests. All right. And for me, I, it was super boring. And they could tell... So as long as I could, as long as I just did pass the test, they kind of just let me do whatever I wanted. Right, right. So I guess yeah, that would kind of propel you to want to get out of there. Um, early. Well, that's that's great. I've known only a few people who managed to do that. So you did like extra classes during the summer, or just kind of score higher? Uh, no, not even summer classes. What I ended up doing is I told. I, there's ways you can, there's ways you could do it. You go up to the office to the principal, or you know, just talk to your teacher, and then you know, say, "Hey, uh, I want to go talk." I want to get out office. of this prison. I want yeah. to get out. Uh, <laughs> who need to talk to? They're like, "Oh, I don't know. Go to the main office, figure right, it right. out." And then you know, you ask, and they look at you weird. Uh, they looked at me like, "What? What? You want to get a class? Well, you can take you can take these exams. You can take the end of the year exam." Mm -hmm. um, when everyone else takes the end of the year exams, and if you pass them with a B, uh, you can have the cre that, that class credit. Hmm. And you have that class as if you've taken it like the entire year. All right. But I, f I find it interesting that you only ha you have to cl pass that class with a B. Whereas if you take it the normal year, it's okay if you just pass with a C. Right, well I guess they just want to double check and make yeah. sure that... They, they want to make sure that, oh, you know what you're doing, and I love... I love the face that they have, like, when I told them I wanted to do that. They told me, oh, we don't think you're going to pass. No. Nah. But, so, I mean, you'll have to get the books and whatever. I'm like, oh, you know what? Just give me the books. Right. I'll, ta I'll take the books. And be like, oh, we will have to pay you have to pay for those books. Oh, fair enough. Whatever. I'll pay for the books. I'll get it. Read, read the books. I, then I waited to the end of the year, took the tests. And when I took all three tests, they, they, they looked at me and were, like, surprised that I did it. They're like, okay. And, you know, they came back uh, later and told me, hey, you totally passed these <laughs> tests. Um, here's your credits. Nice, nice. And then did that uh, for two years for a couple different classes. Did that for 
uh, history class. I did that for English. Would I you say that, that uh, your interest in science, uh, I guess, comes because your, your parents have an interest and kind of dwell in that, in that particular area then? Yeah. When I was growing up, uh, way before I moved into Virginia, when we were in Indiana, my father was doing his PhD at Purdue University. So I grew up in a collegiate atmosphere. I grew up as a little kid. Uh, he would take me to his laboratory and I would be able to see what he would do as a, as a veterinarian. He was doing a lot of epidemiology and a lot of like research into like sicknesses and diseases and you know I was there playing my Game Boy and occasionally glancing over at the slides and looking at stuff and he'd show me hey this is what a kidney looks like <laughs> and like this is what kidney tissue looks like right. you should identify these cells like this. Uh, he, I did that so much that when I was seven years old I would meet he was um, he was teaching because he would be in an adjunct facility because when you're a post grad you help the teachers and professors teach classes. It got to the point where his students would come up and ask questions, and if he was busy doing something, I would look at their at their slides or their or their work, and I'd be like, "Oh, uh, that's the wrong tissue sample. You want this?" Right. And they'd look at me like, "Who who's this kid? Why does he know stuff?" And then somebody would tell him, "Oh, he's the professor's kid. Right. Don't worry about him." <laughs> so did, did you have interest in I guess uh, politics at the time or anything kind of news related or current events? How, how did you view the role uh, at that time? So when I was younger, I too was a good little statist. And I very much believe in order and compelling people to do what they need to do because they're too stupid to know what they want to do or what they need to do. Later on, I lear later on as I grew up, I realized, holy cow, I don't know what I want to do half the time. I should not tell the people what they need to do. <laughs> All right. uh, but the other thing I also realized is if I give myself enough time and I give other people enough time, eventually you figure out, hey, we shouldn't do a few things. Like, we shouldn't be violent. We should totally work things out. Hey, if, and if people are going to mess with you, you know what? Just go away. All right, don't, all right. Don't stay around. It's whatever. I guess in regards to little status, like, what are your thoughts on uh, peaceful parenting? Peaceful parenting. So when I growing up, I got, I was the first child. Uh, in many cases, the first child I feel is kind of like the test child, yeah, like the one they, yeah. they, they they work on and figure out. Oh, what do we do? So they grew up. They did with me what their parents did with them when they were growing up. Of course, this is talking about an older older generation in Mexico where the values are completely different. Uh, Quite so harsher. Uh, a lot yeah. harsher. They got hit when they were kids all the time and yelled at and very, very controlling types kind of family. And with me, they tried that at first when I was little. And as I grew older, they kind of realized he just doesn't really care. Mm -hmm. They mainly realized that because when they would discipline me, you know, I would cry and I would like be hurt and everything, but I would just do the same thing again. Mm -hmm. And then I would even talk to them about it a while, like, hey, well, you know, why do I need to clean my room? It's only going to get dirty again, you know, the classic, <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, the classic little kid kind of fights. And then, you know, as I grew up, I realized, oh, man, I don't like having a dirty room because it sucks. I should totally clean it. And I really think that would, should have been, like, the approach. Now, granted, when I was a little kid, I probably didn't understand that, but you don't need to hit me. You'd be like, look, dirty is bad. All right. But, uh, no. So with me, they were a little bit harsh. But as I grew older, they shied away from that. And then when my sisters came along, they weren't, they weren't violent towards them at all. They were very, always talk things out. Mm. So I very much feel like I got the brunt of like a little bit of bad parenting, but they were loving parents overall. So uh, I think I turned out okay. Yeah, right, yeah, we turned out okay. And then that's what I mean by the standard in which we should, we should, we should strive for higher, better than that. Um, but no, no, I guess I, I, would, I would agree. I guess most older uh, children generally are sometimes they call them the experimental babies. Um, only perhaps the, the parents themselves haven't done much studying and uh, raising and child rearing themselves. It's like, well, I got the handbook for my parents. You know, I'm good to go. Don't right. need to do any study. Whereas your father's doing a lot of studying in this lab. He's doing a lot of uh, medical study for his PhD. Uh, so it kind of seems like it would behoove parents then to do, do it, some extra study and child rearing as well. Because like the information for uh, spanking children and, and the consequences and negative, uh, I guess, abuses, that I guess the, the, the results that occur have been around for, for decades now. Yeah, and I, I will say like it didn't last very long. They really kind of stopped disciplining me like after like I was eight. And 
I think that's really early for most people. And in my case, it was because they encouraged me to be very literate and be very question, question everything right. about life, about what you're doing, about what people tell you, even about what they told me to do. They'd mm -hmm. be like, ask why. Don't just sit there and do it. Right. Um, so, so how, are, how is your relationship with your parents now? My relationship with my parents is actually pretty good. They live in North Carolina. They're only about three hours away. They used to be in Texas. Mm -hmm. After they moved from Richmond and I stayed here, they went to Texas and my dad, my dad, for whatever reason, he hated his the state job doing what he did with epidemiology, and then he decided to go to the Fed, a federal position, and then he discovered that he hated that too. <laughs> go figure, right. right? Now, now he makes vaccines for a small company, and he likes doing that. Nice. I, now, have you had a moment of talk uh, anarchy with him? Yes. Yeah. My dad is. My dad has very anarchic tendencies. Yeah. Um, he still is in that, he still grew up in that generation where he's like, you can't trust anybody. You know, everyone's out to get you. And that's, I also think that's a little bit of a Latino American kind of upbringing I as think well. So, yeah. Because when you go back to Latino America, you can only trust your family. Your family, maybe, and yourself. All right. You know, it's that kind of blood bond that you have with people. And growing up with that kind of mentality, you already have a distrust of the government in and of itself because you think they're a bunch of robbers and a bunch of thieves and murderers, but you also don't have a lot of confidence in the community around you unless they are your family. Right. So from that point of view, do you have anarchic tendencies there? Uh, they just we need they need the more cooperation type kind of thing, and then I think very much they would be completely fine with anarchy. Cool, cool. And I guess in, in areas of, I guess, continued uh, in your interest in pursuit of uh, your degree, uh, but you found uh, an interesting job position still w without it, uh, you know, so what, what do you think, continue going that way and maybe absolving, uh, I guess, some people will say wasting your time in that uh, particular field? Well, ultimately, if I didn't want to find, if I didn't want to do research, which is what I ultimately do want to do, I wouldn't have to go that route. Um, so I had, didn't graduate from VCU yet in biochemistry. I have 18 credits left mm -hmm. worth of classes, which is almost like a trivial amount of classes, yeah. I think. Um, but you know, you don't have them, you don't, you don't get your degree. In the meantime, I've found a number of jobs. I was just recently working with North Carolina as a cybersecurity analyst, doing a lot of hacking and computer related stuff. And I like that. That was super interesting. I've been tinkering with computers since I was since I was in high school, since I was fifteen. Yeah. So that came naturally to me. That and with an inquisitive mind, always questioning, always building, always doing new things, that came easily. Uh, now I accepted a position as a developer with a smaller company doing a lot of data analytics stuff. Nice. Uh, it'll I'm hoping that I'll be able to take a few classes after going to work and it's a really cushy position. Uh, the hours are more or less what I want them to be. It's really nine to five, but I go in and do the projects I need to get done, uh, and I really enjoy it a lot. Nice, and, and, but you did that though. You got to that yeah, without I did a degree. That, so. and that is kind of weird. I did that without a degree. Yeah. Sometimes people do this stuff and ask me like, well, wait, that, how do you have these jobs that you should totally have degrees for? Right. And the thing I tell them is, well, I just, I know, I know sort of what I'm doing, what I don't know, I ask Google. Yeah. Uh, what I don't know, I'm willing to learn. Yeah. And I'm not afraid of asking people what it is they want me to do. Right. Uh, the second thing is I also show that I'm willing to do things. I'm willing to go work hard. Mm -hmm. that, that's something you need to do whether you have a degree or whether you don't. What makes you succeed or, won't, or not succeed professionally is how hard you're willing to work. Right. And the third thing is networking. Somehow... I've been blessed with knowing the right kind of people or having the right attitude to meet the kind of people and people are like, hey, you're a nice guy and you seem to know what you're doing. I know somebody who wants or needs this. Do you yeah. want to provide? And I'll be like, yes or no. I've had positions where I've said no to uh, due to time restrictions or due to you know, not enough money or you know what have you. Right. No, I, I think that's wonderful. That's, that's a great uh, story of success there. Um, like just panning your own resume and building up your own skills. Uh, yeah, and everything you can pretty much find online. Uh, YouTube, there's YouTube classes on pretty much everything we, out there. We live, we live, we live in a world where a few clicks away, you can find knowledge about anything and everything, and it really just takes the five minutes. Just interrupt your cat viewing of videos for five minutes. Go to Wikipedia, learn something about math or something you have questions about, 
and then read that and then go back to your cat videos and you've now learned something. <laughs> or go to the uh, Mises uh, Wikipedia entry. Uh, okay, okay, so I remember we met at a VCU uh, and, and doing this pretty anarchy thing. And so I guess uh, what we're talking about, I guess, uh, what are your thoughts, I guess, on, uh, I guess, anarchy in itself then, um, I guess, in, in terms of logic, because you do... Well, for me, it was actually kind of really, it was really uh, a lot, it was a logical choice. You came to me and asked me three questions, like, do I, do I do use violence every day to accomplish my goals? Do I use violence as a tool to do what I need to do? And I said, no. Do you believe that it's wrong to use violence against others? Uh, you know, not not counting for self-defense, right. which is so if violence has me because of self-defense, that's a consequence, not a means to an end. Right. And I agreed with that statement. And the third, would would I be okay with using violence as a tool to make compel other people or other parties to do something that whether they it, whether it's something they want to or not to do to force them to do something is that in, is that incorrect or is that wrong? And I said yes. And then. Once I thought about that, that re made me realize, well, the kind of society we live in kind of hinges on using violence as a tool. Obviously, there's something wrong with that. And that's something that does need to be addressed. If we say to be a so an advanced society where we're all high and mighty or that we feel that we're a good society, well, we shouldn't use violence as a tool. Right. And so for me, it was a very logical uh, three-step choice of, oh, hey, yes, 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 you're completely right. Done. <laughs> yeah, that was that fast, I remember. Yeah, I was like, all right, yeah, it's like a formula. Yeah, got it. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't need to be anything else. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and you have, you have interesting uh, viewpoints. I think uh, recently you traveled uh, to Israel, right? And I guess in terms of we're talking about state violence, um, what, what are your thoughts then? Because you, you have an interesting background, I guess, connection with that place. Yeah. So in, so in addition to my family being from Mexico City, they all, we also have the added benefit or detriment, however you want to look at it, of also being Jewish. There's not a lot of Mexican Jews, but it is it is part of my it is part of the tradition that I choose to uphold, uh, and so it does give an interesting like context, like when I went to visit Israel in January, uh, and I'll tell you it's it's weird over yeah. there. Like you have, it's almost like you have two different societies completely different societies separated literally by meters hmm. like we're not talking about oh uh like richmond city and washington dc right. like not that kind of distance we're talking about across the street mm -hmm. you if you it's like going from monroe park crossing belvedere and now you're somewhere else it's completely bizarre hmm. uh and so that immediately when you go there you immediately he, now when you see the stories and you hear the news, now you have a completely different viewpoint. Like, wow, stuff is really close together. I'm surprised, like, not everybody is dead. Right. Like, so obviously some things don't work. But obviously some things working because people aren't killing each other left and right in, at all times. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of context on both sides. And on terms of the Israelis, on the Israeli side, there's a lot, there's a lot of violence. There's a lot of decision-making made by the government because there's a lot of perceived threats. There's a lot of uh, potential danger that they see. And a lot of that comes because the Israeli government inherits a lot of psyche or a lot of the gestalt from the Jewish psyche. And the Jewish psyche is very much not very happy with everybody who isn't Jewish. Mm -hmm. Just, uh, and that's to think of the, most everybody's familiar with the Holocaust. But in Jewish, in Jewish history, every generation there's usually some kind of event or something that tries to rise against and like punish punish Israel or the Jewish people. Yeah, they have a tremendous uh, history. So, right there, ha forming some kind of socialist government from that kind of psyche is already a recipe for okay, this might be bad, or this might end up being violent. And then on the other side, you have the Palestinians who were there before the, the Israeli, were Israelis came along, before the State of Israel was the State of Israel. And there's a whole, there's a bunch of fighting, starting just with 1947. People on both sides disagree about, well, the, the Jews came and like they wanted to establish a thing peacefully, but the Arabs said no. But the Jews were like, well, we're not going to leave, so whatever. And then the Arabs were like, oh, we'll leave or we'll declare war. They declared war, and then magically the, the Jews won. 
the Arabs say, oh, they had all the support of the countries all around them, and the Jews were like, well, we just fought for our lives. What you end up happening, what ends up happening, a lot of annexation happens, people lose their property, people lose a lot of things, and then it just, it kind of kept snowballing up until 1973, where now you have international international borders, like actually, and UN resolutions coming in, and now everyone's trying to take effect, and there's a lot of hurt and a lot of pain on both sides. Mm -hmm. And I really didn't appreciate that until I was there and saw how there's violence sponsored on both sides. On, these, on the Israeli side, it's completely sponsored through their training in the IDF. And it's completely sponsored through how the people think, how they feel unsafe. Mm -hmm. And on the other side, there's a, there's a lot of indoctrination. There's a lot of te there's a lot of teaching, a lot of context of oh, the Israelis ruined everything, which is kind of true, but it's there's blame on both sides. It's it's a lot. To, it's just a lot to talk about right now. That will be that will be a discussion. We should probably for do a topic on that. Yeah, that's, 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 that's an entire to topic. Unravel. Yeah, that's an entire other topic, and it's actually some interesting things. I would like to actually take away take from Israel, uh, specifically the thing called kibbutz. A kibbutz is a community. They're, they're small communes of people that kind of do whatever they want. Right now, Israel is kind of a socialist nation. Mm -hmm. But the idea of the kibbutz is what led Israel to actually be prosperous. They turned the desert into actually green forested land. They actually can actually do stuff there. And it happened because they have these agrarian uh, agorism communities that just formed spontaneously. And they for the kibbutz have been there since before Israel as a nation existed. They started with the Zionist movement back in the 1800s mm -hmm. with Jews from Eastern Europe and Russia going there and said, hey, uh, we just want to live peacefully in these barren lands and we'll figure out how to make them flourish. Yeah. And they did. Uh, and I think there's a lot of models we could take away from that, uh, put it in a, a macro-capitalist type kind of mentality or maybe even like kind of semi commune type kind of thing without as long as everything's consensual right, and agree yeah. within everybody and use that model and spread it out everywhere else I think they have a good model and everything in Israel is about uh, renewable resources mm -hmm. because they live in a desert and because it's kind of hard for them to trade with the neighbors around them given that they're kind of hated right every every all the technology in Israel is based upon recycling renewability and making things flourish and taking care of the earth around you, which is something I think we should very much strive to achieve here. Right. If we could achieve that kind of renewability and emphasis on recycling and emphasis on being good to your surroundings, that would be excellent. Yeah, yeah. I, I think uh, you also came across something interesting in those communities, so I guess an, uh, I guess a community of Bitcoin uh, users, right? Or, oh, yeah. Uh, There's... The tech scene in Israel is ridiculous. There's a lot of emphasis on coding and technology and innovative thinking. Uh, it's why Tel Aviv is a ridiculous, huge city now, and it's like one of the top, well, one of the top cities for technology nowadays. Uh, and that was also another thing that I really liked about Israel. They they love technology and they love science. So when I went there, I'm like, oh yay! <laughs> it's a country of nerds. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> but. But, uh, but yeah, but it was actually, when I was there, it was actually relatively peaceful. Mm -hmm. During the past couple of months, there's been a lot of fighting. Right. Uh, but mainly throughout the years, for all the stuff we hear in the news and for all the things that happen, it's kind of quiet. Mm -hmm. And even when there is something going on, well, actually, no, never mind. Let me rephrase that. If you could, when there is something happening, Something that would scare me, like when I hear shots, like artillery barrages firing off in the distance, I was like, what's going on? The Israelis would look at me and be like, what? Oh, that's normal. Yeah. Don't worry about it. Like, if, there, if it's coming towards this direction, there'll be alarms. Right. That's just another thing that shows me that the population there is completely inured to violence. Like, like growing up in a war wow. zone. Yeah. It's like, it's weird. Hmm. I guess uh, what you would go back still, right? I want to go back. Yeah. It was it was a lot of fun when I went there. Nice. nice. Uh, I'd like to take away a lot from like what they're doing there, technology wise, and what they're doing, uh, like what they're trying to do, like 
to to foment peace between bo both peoples, uh, and that's something I find personally for me that would be good. Yeah, I guess. So, what would you see yourself? I guess your future prospects. What do you see yourself? Uh, I guess what what projects or goals do you have like for the next uh, couple of years, <laughs> ten years from now? So. Ideally, like I said before, I want to move into research, and specifically, I would like to go into nanotechnology research, uh, figuring out how to use swarm computation and nanotechnology and chemistry and put that together to make new things, like new medical imaging devices or new, uh, new techniques for surgery, eliminating the need for overt large physical surgeries and doing surgeries in a liquid medium, in your blood or in your organs, just by controlling these nanorobots or controlling amorphous solids inside of your body. Mm -hmm. That's that's what I would like to do, and that's a little bit ways away, but it's not that far away. Right, right. Uh, I guess I guess before we wrap up before the last two questions, like well what does uh, anarchy mean to you? To me, anarchy is I believe some what our next stage as a society of humans is. We need to step away from our violent tendencies. We inherited our violent tendencies from evolving as animals on this planet. But now we are at a point we can step we can step away from it if we choose to and if we so desire. And I believe that our next stage as hum as evolving as humans and as the next stage is us being able to develop and guide our own evolution hinges on us being able to understand how can we have an anarchic society and still be organized but not be violent about it. Mm -hmm. How can we how can we actually sit down and actually talk to each other nonviolently? How can we get along? Really, I don't think we can reach the next stage of our human evolution until we learn, hey, how can we get along? Right. That's what it means for me. Uh, I, I know that seems very ambiguous, but that's a very real problem that most people have. Everybody has conflicts at some point in their day or something that can't work, but we don't fly off our rocker and start shooting everybody, as we shouldn't. Right. And what would you, uh, I guess, in regards to, if you had one government monopoly that you can end immediately, say there's a button, people always talk about, you know, if uh, the government were to end tomorrow, well, that would mean that people give up on the idea, let go of the idea that violence will set us free, and great, we have anarchy. But say that uh, there'd be a cascading row of dominoes, and the first one that you can end the government monopoly on, uh, which would you choose? So, I would actually choose, the the financial systems and I, the reason I say that is because the 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 idea we how we handle financial systems and how we do transactions foments to, in antiquity and today has fomented and given governments the power that they wield mm -hmm. we, I'm not saying we should do away with the financial system or get rid of money completely. No, that's obviously not the thing. Money is necessary. We need to exchange goods. Trade is good. Yeah. Uh, business is better than war. Way better than war. Uh, what I mean by that is separating the control that governments have over the way we think and how we think, oh, they need to control or they need to manipulate the market. That's something we very desperately need to just shy away from. We need to take away. Right, yeah, uh, I guess like the Fed, for example, uh, monopoly on currency. Cool, I guess, and that's an area I guess you haven't interested with uh, digital currencies. Yeah, with, I, with that, I think the cryptological currencies like Bitcoin and Litecoin are a very good step forward. Is there is no central control. Mm -hmm. no, no private party, government or otherwise, can take control of how this currency is distributed. It's completely anonymous. Uh, it, you don't have to be anonymous if you choose not to. Right. But the transactions and the way it's received, you have value transferred from point A to point B, uh, and no and no one can control or see what's happening. Yeah, you finally have a freedom of privacy return. Right. Yeah. Cool. Well, thank you so much for uh, joining us in the fight against the state and uh, for helping us to spread anarchy in Richmond. I think uh, we've had a fun, what, two or three years now running. Yeah, it's, yeah. <laughs> I've barely noticed time going away. It's like, what? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I'm Kamal Wane. And I'm Herzan Flores. See you guys at the Victor Party. Thanks for watching. Take good care.